Hi, I'm Deirdre Byrne. I'm here for Montgomery Community Media, and I have Catherine Feldman with me, who is the head of contact tracing for Maryland Department of Health. Um, I guess my first question for you is to tell me about what is contact tracing and what is the role of a contact tracer? Right. Okay. Well, thank you for that question and, and for the opportunity to be here. So contact tracing is a public health tool that has been used for decades. Um, it's not something new and, and, and uh, recently thought of. It is uh, an essential public health tool to help stop the spread of disease. And so what it involves is identifying um, those individuals who are cases, uh, reaching out to them, giving them guidance on how to stay at home, stay isolated, and also asking them who their contacts are, anyone they might have infected. Um, and, and then we reach out to the contacts and also provide them guidance and recommendations to stay at home. Um, and that way, both the cases and the people they might have infected are removed from the community and transmission is stopped. So contact tracers are clearly the um, critical component of this. Contact tracers are people. This is a very laborious effort. Um, and so contact tracers are people who make the phone calls and talk to the community, talk to the cases, talk to their contacts, make sure they have the resources they need, check in on their health, and then do the, um, the, the difficult job of uh, making sure that everyone who the case might have infected is listed so that we can go ahead, reach out to them, and, and stop the spread of disease. Thank you. And can you tell me how many contact tracers um, the state of Maryland has? And if you know the answer to this, because we serve mostly Montgomery County, how many contact tracers there would be in a place like Montgomery County? Right. So I can tell you how contact tracing is set up in Maryland right now. I mentioned that it is a very labor-intensive process. It requires a lot of people power. And that also provides the personal touch, which, which um, means that our contact tracers are, are ensuring people are okay. We have around 1,300, uh, 1,350 contact tracers in Maryland serving um, Maryland cases and um, contacts. The contact tracers are um, divided between a state call center and then also contact tracers uh, located um, in local health departments. And so there are 24 local health departments in, in Maryland and Montgomery County, of course, is one of the largest um, populations in Maryland and, and a very robust uh, local health department. So the uh, effort to reach out to Maryland residents is a joint effort between the state call center um, in coordination with contact tracers in the county health departments. And so um, it, I can't tell you the exact number in Montgomery County, um, but uh, do understand that it is a very close coordination between the state and Montgomery County to make sure the residents of Montgomery County are taken care of. So from what I understand, one of the keys to limiting the spread of the virus is contacting the contacts of somebody who has coronavirus within a 24 hour period. Could you take me through a call like this and what percentage of contacts are reached? And I imagine if somebody's going to the grocery store that they don't have necessarily, the person diagnosed doesn't have necessarily every single contact they've known. So can you tell me a little bit about any gaps in the data? Right. Right. So you're asking about the whole contact tracing process. And as you pointed out nicely, time is of the essence. We want to uh, reach out to an individual as soon as possible after those results are reported to the Maryland Department of Health. So uh, right now, if individuals um, don't feel well, they think they might have COVID and they go get a test, we're recommended, recommending that they stay isolated even while they're waiting for those test results. So um, we can't directly control the time it takes to get the test result but we are asking uh, people who think they have COVID to stay at home from the time they think they, um, they might have COVID. We get the test result and we wanna reach out as soon as possible after that test result. So of course, um, we've heard in the news uh, concerns about uh, a long turnaround time for testing. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of good work recently to shorten that time, but still there is gonna be a delay between when somebody gets tested and when they get the result of that test. So again, we want folks to stay at home. As Soon as that result is reported to the state health department, it will um, flow into the contact tracing system and we're gonna initiate that outreach to the case. Now, there are a lot of reasons people might not pick up the phone. Um, they might not be immediately available. Sometimes we might not have the best phone number to reach somebody. Sometimes they might answer, but there might be language barriers. So there are a lot of reasons um, 
for why we might not get through to them on that first attempt. But we keep trying, of course, because this is so important. And so when we do talk to the individual, we first verify that they are who we think they are. Um, and then we ask them about their health and make sure they're okay. From there, we are gonna ask them some questions about where they might have been in the past two weeks leading up to when they started to feel unwell so that we can perhaps learn about where they were exposed, when they got infected. And that allows public health to take actions if, if actions are needed, say it was an outbreak or something. We're also going to find out um, who all their contacts were in the um, two days before symptoms started to the time of the interview. And as you pointed out, there are a lot of um, potential gaps there, but I do wanna define what close contact means. So a close contact is somebody who has been within six feet of an individual for at least 15 minutes. So when you define it that way, you can start to peel off some of the, uh, the more casual um, interactions, like if you walk by somebody in a grocery store, they would not meet the definition of a close contact. So, um, but you're right that there could potentially be some, some gaps, um, which is why I'd like to underscore basic preventive messaging that we have for everyone, which is, you know, limit your travel, you're safer at home. If you must go out, wear a mask, physical distance, and wash your hands frequently. And these are all things you can do to, to reduce risk. So hypothetically speaking, let's say I was to go to a dinner party with somebody and the host of the party gets the coronavirus and the contact tracer reaches out to me and tells me I've been in contact with somebody with coronavirus. What, tell me a little bit about what does the contact tracer say to me? Do they recommend that I get a test? And is there any follow-up um, with the contacts to see, to try to, I guess, measure, are these contacts also getting the virus? Right. So, no, these are great questions. So, uh, uh, contact tracer is going to reach out to the contacts. They're going to explain to that individual that they were exposed, they were, they were named as a close contact of somebody who was diagnosed with COVID-19. Now, the contact tracer is not going to say who that case was. Um, they go to extreme measures to protect the privacy and confidentiality of, of the individuals, whether the cases are contacts. So, the name of the infected person will not be revealed. So, the contact tracer will explain to the contact you were listed as a close contact of somebody who was diagnosed with COVID-19. We recommend that you get tested. So in a general way, we recommend anyone who might have been exposed to um, COVID-19 to get tested. Um, and they're gonna provide guidance on what to do for the recommended 14-day quarantine period for contacts, um, including asking, do you need help to navigate being in quarantine? And if so, that's when the local health department can really um, connect people to resources. Then there is follow-up for both cases and contacts for a certain time period um, after isolation or quarantine starts. So for cases, people who are unwell, the cases must meet certain criteria in order to be released from isolation. And so there will be regular check-ins over that isolation period from the contact tracers to make sure that people are um, improving, their symptoms are improving, and then to ultimately release them from isolation. So uh, for a case, they are in isolation for at least 10 days from the day their symptoms first started, and they must show at least one day of their symptoms being improved and not having a fever in the absence of fever-reducing medication. People who are in quarantine, these are the contacts who uh, were exposed to a case, as long as they do not develop symptoms, they're in quarantine for 14 days. And the reason for 14 days is that's what we call the incubation period for the disease. So somebody can develop disease up to 14 days after being exposed to it. So we wanna monitor folks every day through that 14 day period to make sure they're doing okay and that they don't become a case. If they become a case, the process starts all over again. We get their contacts. Now, hopefully they've been at home, they've been following the quarantine recommendations, they've been at home and they won't have had the opportunity to infect others. And that's how transmission is stopped in the community. So there's, um, here in Montgomery County and uh, across Maryland, I guess, there's a debate being had about whether private schools can reopen. Um, and let's say that some private schools in Montgomery County do reopen in the fall, at the end of August, at the beginning of um, September. Is there a pl special plan in place for schools? And if a teacher 
or a student comes down with a virus, um, what role the contact tracer would, would play, what they would recommend for a school, because obviously if, if a student comes down with a virus and you would contact people, you're not going to say the name of the person who has the right. virus. So there seems to be some um, obstacles maybe that, that have to be overcome with contact tracing. So your question about contact tracing in schools is a great one. Um, you know, we, we um, when developing our contact tracing program, um, uh, quickly understood the complexity of everything. So we need to coordinate with the schools as well as many other um, similar situations that have their own special needs, whether that's um, uh, contact tracing for nursing home situations or, or other settings. So uh, in public health, um, I've, I've mentioned that there are very strong uh, local health departments in Maryland. And so there is a long history of local health departments working um, hand in hand with the, their school districts and their other partners. And so just as with um, other situations that public health has been managing for, for years, whether it's an outbreak in a school setting for, because of a foodborne illness or something else, um, there, there are processes in place whereby um, the schools and the local health department would coordinate to make sure that um, there was a response specific for the school, and that would include contact tracing. And so, again, we really want to underscore we maintain privacy and confidentiality. Um, that's paramount. There uh, will undoubtedly be some need to, to um, understand where the infected person went during the course of a school day. So. Uh, uh, once privacy safeguards are um, insured and we have permissions, we would need to share the name of somebody with uh, a top leadership at a school. But in a general way, the school community should not be notified of who was sick in the community. But we would want to make sure that the contacts were properly notified so they could take precautions, monitor themselves for symptoms. And, and stop the spread of the disease. I guess in, in kind of the similar, um, we've heard a lot about hotspots like nursing homes. Um, is there anything, any special procedure in place for contact tracers working with nursing homes? Contact tracing is part of the whole larger COVID response. And that includes um, uh, teams who are investigating outbreaks, teams who are specifically dealing with nursing homes. So there um, is a lot of communication back and forth. So what we learn from contact tracing, if um, there's an indication of an outbreak in a certain setting, we'll hand that off and coordinate with our outbreak um, response groups. Similarly, if they learn of a situation and um, there are contacts that need to be um, identified or, or uh, monitored, they'll make sure that they're in our system. So there's a lot of back and forth um, between these uh, different groups working on the various aspects of the COVID response. So at one of the governor's last press conferences, he, um, he brought with him some data about contact tracing, um, about transmission rates and where the virus is being spread. Could you tell me a little bit about um, the data that you collect and is it available for the public to look at? Um, how often is it updated and Right. In the course of the interview with the case, we ask uh, the case where, um, what kinds of gatherings, um, what kind of uh, high risk locations they might have visited um, in the 14 days leading up to their illness. And this way we can get insight into where they might have been exposed. There is no, no way we can actually link um, what they report with being the definitive source of their infection. That's, we just don't have those data. Um, or the, um, it's not that we don't have the data, it's that it's impossible to go back and fully understand that that's, that's where they might have been um, infected. But it does provide us insight into the movement of people and allows us to understand better if um, people are, um, are going to one particular location or they think that uh, one kind of activity is okay to do and maybe we need to put some additional messaging out there about uh, safeguards people can, can do, such as wearing a mask and washing hands and keeping physical distance. So um, at the press conference, we talked about um, uh, some of the, the uh, responses people gave when asked the question, um, did you attend large gatherings with 10 or more people? And um, we're always refining our processes. So this was a relatively new question we've been asking folks. And so we have very incomplete data. Um, on that because it is a very new question. Of those who indicated they had gone somewhere, 44% um, said they attended family gatherings. But that, that um, 
is only 44% of those who indicated they had attended a, a large gathering. There were also people who, who just didn't answer the question. So it's not like 44% of everybody said they'd been to a family gathering. Um, it's, it's a much smaller proportion of our cases um, actually attended family gatherings um, or house parties or outdoor events. So these data processes we're constantly refining um, and, and looking at. They're not available publicly. It's a data point that if we think um, can be um, meaningfully interpreted um, and, and give insights as to where people might have been infected um, and would be good to, to post publicly, we'll do that. And we're always looking to review our, our uh, public facing metrics. And in fact, I'd encourage folks to go to our website and see what we do post publicly so they can um, follow the progress of the contact tracing program in Maryland. Can you tell me about patterns that you have seen in the data? I know that we've heard about more young people are contracting the virus. Um, so could you tell me a little bit about your observations? Your uh, question is a great one. Um, we're certainly hearing in a general way that uh, the, the sh there's a shift in who is being infected and it, and it does tend to be younger people and um, right now. And so we're seeing that echoed in contact tracing and, and um, just anecdotally, these are not from, um, from data summaries or anything, but anecdotally, we are hearing from the young people that they're going out and attending events. And so we really want to underscore that, first of all, young people are not immune. Uh, they, they can get ill and they can get seriously ill. Young people can also spread the disease to um, individuals who might uh, be at higher risk of developing severe disease. And so um, younger people, we'd like to, to underscore that you're safer at home, you're safer in smaller gatherings. Um, if you do go out, um, wear a mask, uh, keep physical distance, um, wash your hands frequently, do all the things that we know can really help prevent the spread of this disease. With that in mind, with you know, the possibility of parents who might, have, who, who might have children at a private school and might have the option to go virtual or to go in person or to do some sort of mix of the two, do you have any advice um, for them for guiding their, their, cho their options in this? Right, well, as a parent, I'm a parent, so it's a, a very uh, fraught decision as to what you want your children to do. Um, with school coming up. And so uh, any parent is gonna have to make that individual uh, choice as to um, uh, what risk they wanna expose their child to and what the, the potential benefits would be of going back to an um, in-person school setting. So, so all I can really say to that is as a parent, I, I completely sympathize with the uh, difficult choices that, that we're having to make these days. I guess with contact tracing for children, if they're under the age of 18, um, it, how does, can you tell me a little bit about contact tracing with people under the age of 18 and how that, how that works? And, um, absolutely, absolutely. So we have cases and contacts who are under the age of 18. So when we call, we're going to ask to speak to a parent. And so um, that interview will generally be conducted with, with a parent or a, a proxy, an older person, somebody over 18. Obviously, this seems like it's still kind of a new process, contact tracing with the coronavirus. And um, can you tell me about how it's evolving in Maryland and if, if there's any um, long-term plans? I've, there are some countries um, where there seems to be apps that have to do with contact tracing. Is there any technological advances that you're looking into or um, anything of that nature? Right, so again, let me underscore that contact tracing is nothing new. This is a, a tried and true public health tool that um, public health officials have been using um, to uh, stop the spread of diseases like Ebola and measles and tuberculosis and sexually transmitted infections and rabies. So this kind of investigation is something that we're well familiar with. Now, COVID has, um, the scale of COVID is just something that, that I don't think any of us could have predicted. And so um, it is allowing us to put processes in place um, that can handle the scale of COVID. In Maryland, we anticipate this is gonna be something we're gonna be doing for the long term. As you uh, noted, um, processes are evolving, it's new. We always wanna do better. We always wanna make things um, better so that we can stop the spread of disease in the community so that our local health departments um, have the resources they need in order to do this um, 
very uh, difficult, laborious work. And so if there are technological um, ways to, to do that, we'll explore those. So I don't have an answer for you as to you know, exactly where we'll be in six months, um, but we are examining a lot of different options and always seeking to improve. What lessons have, have you learned so far from contact tracing with the coronavirus specifically since um, the efforts for this virus began? I think the, the key lessons I've learned are that there's a real need to educate the public. So I can't thank you enough for this opportunity um, to demystify what um, contact tracing is. Really, as public health people, we want to make sure the members of our community are okay. And that's why we're calling. We're calling to check in on your health and make sure that you and your family and your community are taken care of. Then on the flip side, in, in um, talking to the people who make these calls all day, they say that when they do talk to people, they're incredibly appreciative of the calls and that they really um, are thankful for the concern that um, the public health community is showing them and, and for the guidance on how to navigate this difficult time. I think that the, one of the biggest challenges is just getting people to answer the phone. So if people see the number or the, the caller ID MD COVID come up on, on their phone or the number 240-466, 4488 than to answer the phone because that's a contact tracer calling to check in on you and, and really make sure that you and your family are okay. We have been hearing about scams with contact tracing. So those are that's the caller ID, that's the phone number people have to look for. If if somebody sees something else, they shouldn't Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. Unfortunately, there are always scammers out there. So it's important to know what's what's real and what's not. So if you see MD COVID or 240-466-4488 please answer the phone. Please know that, that we want to reach out and um, make sure you're okay. And I might have asked you this again, but I just wanted to follow up. What is, the it, what is the percentage of people who are not reached or is that a number that is improving? There's more people that are reached over time? These are some of the metrics that we are posting publicly, the percent that are reached. Um, and so um, we are currently reaching around 79% of our cases. And that is that has improved over time. So, so yes, we think we are making good progress. But again, we need folks to answer the phone and um, just let us check in on you and make sure everything's okay so we can stop the spread of this disease. Great. And I think that is pr pretty much all of my questions. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add that I didn't ask you about or any other, anything else that the public should be aware of or be careful of um, during this public health crisis? No, I'd just like to... Um, underscore the importance of all the preventive measures. So uh, people really should try to limit um, where they go, uh, wear masks, um, physically distance, um, and, and, and wash your hands. And then should you get infected, please uh, participate in our contact tracing program. Again, it's MD COVID 240-466-4488. One more question. Are, are they going to, are they still hiring contact tracers over time? Um, and did they, did they work at home, I guess is my question. Right. So most of the contact tracers are working at home. Thankfully, um, what you really need for this is a computer and a phone. Um, and uh, we're, we're always looking to make sure we have sufficient numbers. Um, and so uh, various local health departments are hiring. Um, we also might be hiring at the state call center from time to time. Um, so we're always uh, looking to ensure we have enough resources to, to meet the demand. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I really, really appreciate it. You are most welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm.